the match is ready now. So without further ado, let's head down to the feature match area. This is for third place, season one, Mitgo Masters, Jake Beardsley versus Edgar Otto Sanchez And this feels like it's almost a high roll, taking a look at Eduardo's hand. How much, how important do you think the play draw is going to be? Uh, I would imagine immensely, particularly with a hand like this. Like, uh, Eduardo's best hands are almost agnostic of play draw, where you're playing Leoline Binding plus um, Scion of Draco. But with a hand like this, where a black threat that's giving lifelink is interactable, being on the play is massive. It's probably going to be another turn of lifelink you get in one fewer turn of attacking, and that's really good for Eduardo. Yeah, and we see Goblin Guide come down on the first turn for Jake, and this Searing Blade in Jake's hand is the kind of thing I'd expect to be bad, but it looks pretty good here. Yeah, I mean you gotta get those you gotta get rid of those scions some way or the other, and like getting in some damage on top of that is nice. And of course, I mean, if it comes down to it, can get rid of the Orcish Bowmasters at instant speed to prevent life gain. Uh Searing Blazes Searing Blaze only deals three damage on the kicker, but can notably uh on the landfall trigger, but can notably kill Orcish Bowmasters at instant speed with one damage at any time, which is really re pretty relevant for turning off life gain for uh, Eduardo. And look at this. We see Goblin Guide just shove right into the red zone. Again, Sanch Gallag with a sort of forced block on Eduardo's side. And that, that makes a lot of sense to me, given uh, Eduardo's already taken a bunch of damage, partly from the guide, partly from his lands. And Jake has a bunch of burn on burn in his hand. So Eduardo's on a clock. The game, the, like, in a few turns, the game is going to end. And Jake wants to put pressure on Eduardo to. Uh, fi J Jake wants to put pressure on Eduardo to like find an answer, find something, and not let Eduardo get in too much damage himself, so that he can't apply his own clock to Eduardo, uh, to Jake, and uh, take advantage of Jake maybe stumbling a bit with awkward sequencing with skewer the critic, uh, skewer the critics, and other spells. And look at this: we saw a long pause on this monastery swift spear, whether they should attack with these skewer the critics in hand for Jake. It, I kind of like this Lava Spike faces the place approach with Eduardo already down to six. Yeah, that makes sense. That's exactly enough points of burn in Jake's hand, so that way you don't need to worry about interaction as long as there's not any life gained. Oh, and I can tell you from the last match that I just played against Eduardo, there is no instant speed life gain. I'm very positive of that. Well, technically, there is a bind of instant speed life gain here, where Orcish Bowmasters gains lifelink with Scion of Draco and ga gains one point of life. <laughs> okay. I mean, it feels like that could matter a lot here. Yeah, well, that, that one point is super problem. crucial. Right, yeah, yeah. The difference between six and seven is huge. And I, I mean, I imagine the the Bomas is going to need to get hit with Skewer here, so it's ga functionally gaining another three life. Otherwise, Eduardo gains more life on his turn, and it's starting to look pretty tough for Jake. Maybe I don't think the Skewer is just priced into going upstairs, right? So it puts Eduardo to one, and then the Bowmasters can go back up to three. But then. Uh, you're no, yeah, yeah. Abs yeah, absolutely correct. I'm too used to Layla of the Guild back giving all your creatures the ability that Scion bestows, rather absolutely. than just those creatures getting them. Yeah, and now there's this weird spot where Jake's like, all right, well, top of the library, heart of the cards. Yeah, and this is, I mean, there's obviously just the one turn here for Jake. Uh, there were there were a few draws here for Eduardo that would have pretty much just ended the game. Something like another Bowmasters would likely have done it, but Grief certainly not doing that. Yeah, Bowmasters would have been a pretty nice get here, and honestly, Tribal Flames is just five haste damage, so with six on the battlefield and Jake at eleven, this is closer than it looks. Yeah, just one point off. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How many times are we going to say that back and forth in this matchup? I feel like we're really, we're just on loop here. Yeah, and no attack with the Bowmasters might look strange there. But it, or with the Momasters, all the token might look strange, but it makes a lot of sense given the Searing Blaze is the only one damage sauce in the deck. 
Oh God. Well, <laughs> speak of the devil. And but th this is what's so great about this series, right? Is we talk so much about agency, about things mattering, and it can feel like it comes down to a top deck. But there, Eduardo did have an, a line he could have taken where he could have shrunk the number of top decks Jake had access to. And that is the point that mattered. These are the edges that these games are won and lost on. Yeah, it's, 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 really, the, it's really the smallest things. Right, every point matters, right? That was back and forth. Oh, God, they go to one. Oh, God, they're a point short. Oh, God, this is only one damage. How sick is this? And looking at the sideboards, Eduardo really only has what, one, two cards to bring in. What do you, what is Jake doing? Uh, I'd imagine. I, I think that sometimes Jake could try and bring in paths to exile for Scion if that proves to be a problem. But really, the rest of the deck is a little awkward in how it lines up. Uh, I guess Eduardo doesn't have that much main deck interaction. Well, there's the there's the leyline bindings. There's a limited amount of main deck interaction for the ensnaring bridges, but I mean, it get, we talked a, a little bit about how over a long game, Jake gets that sense of inevitability where if Eduardo can't kill him, he will eventually just find enough burn to kill Eduardo. And ensnaring bridge definitely plays into that, where it requires yet another answer. Otherwise, like just stalls out the game infinitely and lets Jake top deck enough burn to win. And this is really interesting that we see these pick your poisons coming in for Eduardo and then a bunch of Eidolans hitting the showers for Jake. It's like now all of a sudden Ensnaring Bridge is the only thing that card even hits, but Eduardo just, like he said, he has to bring it in because otherwise he's cold to these Ensnaring Bridges. Yeah, and you talked about Thin Edges and in this in the series, and that's what's come, That's another thing that's come down to time and time again is respecting cards via sideboard that your opponent's not actually keeping in. We saw this happen with you and Eduardo, where you had to fetch awkwardly, pay some extra life to play around Blood Moon just in case you brought it in, and we're seeing it here again with Pick Your Poison being a pretty clunky sideboard card to bring in that Eduardo is somewhat forced to. Ooh, God. Speaking of awkward hands, Orcish Bowmasters pick your poison Cyan of Draco. Is this one of just the classic keep lose sort of situations? I mean, maybe. I the, that the those points of lifelink off of Orcish Bowmasters can really matter if it's not a defensive hand from Jake. And I mean, turn two four four is not nothing. But that said, yeah, this deck really would struggle on five when you're performing like so many actions on your first turn with evoking and leyline that put you down cards. So it makes sense to keep a clunky, a clunky but like higher potential payoff uh, six rather than mull to something that won't really be functional. Right. There's a point where some of the grief scam draws really go down a lot in power whenever your opponent's deck is just as hyper redundant as Jake's. Exactly. Is. Yeah. There's not grief scamming your opponent is not a guarantee to victory on its own this matchup because Jake's deck just has so many things that deal three damage. And we see Sign of Draco come down, and it actually means Jake can't attack on turn two, suspends a couple Rift Bolts, and passes back. That's got to get at least a little sigh of relief from Eduardo. Yeah, it would be it would be a little better if it, if Eduardo had like other pressure going on. Uh, as it stands, it's a little awkward where uh, if he tries to play into the Scion plan, like. Uh, gain life with Arkish Bowmasters, then that's going to leave it in a pretty awkward spot with the Scion getting double bolted. And if he doesn't play into the Scion plan and just does this, well, that's six points at the face. And at that point, it, uh, Jake only needs 10 more points and to the best of Eduardo's knowledge, has four cards in hand. So not very many good options for Eduardo here. And this is a really interesting spot where Jake has so many lands in hand. I almost wonder if we might just see a sorcery speed crack of Sunbake Canyon to dodge some life gain. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. Uh, the only the only point possibly against that is just the the clock is going to be really tight here. This creature is attacking that provide a two turn clock, and so efficiency of mana usage might end up being really important for Jake. Where if he spends this turn not playing out Boros Charm and drawing, then he's basically guaranteeing that he's not going to be able to kill next turn. And I don't know that he's going to get a third turn after that. So he might need to do something like Boros Charm this turn and then hope 
there's not a Bowmasters left up and you draw to two one mana three damage burn spells, the top two cards. Sure, that totally makes sense to me. We see Monastery Swift Spear hit the battlefield, Sunbake Canyon along with it, and just passing the turn, I would guess if Jake's not cracking the canyon now, this is a pretty loud signal that he's going to agree with what you're saying and just wants to borrow his charm and hope to draw a couple ones and dodge the Bowmasters. Yeah, and I mean... Eduardo doesn't have like a great line with the Bowmasters either, where if he main phases it, he's kind of showing his hand and and Jake can play accordingly. And if he doesn't main phase it, then, well, a lot of the burn spells in Jake's decks are instants and could get killed in response to it. And here's something interesting. This territorial Kavu actually is me going to mean that Eduardo does have the option to just rummage away this pick your poison, which has just been rotting in his hand the whole game. Yeah, free card here would certainly help. I mean, that's more draw, so it's something that matters. Ooh, ends up chucking land away instead, draws a grief. That's a big lifelink creature, theoretically. Yeah, it's a it's a little awkward to lose the to lose the land that lets grief get actually cast. But um, so I I don't know that it's gonna come down to that specifically here. Uh, I just don't think it's gonna last another two turn cycles for the grief to be attacking. But what it might come down to instead is the grief trying to snipe something from Jake's hand after he draws with Bowmasters, maybe? Mm -hmm. Who draws with Sunbake Canyon? Uh, that's the main angle axis I could see it being relevant on. Okay, we see that Boros Charmon and Steph you've been talking about, as well as a Bowmasters to meet it, pings Jake, up a life for Eduardo, drawing off a Sunbake Canyon and getting that extra ping off the Bowmasters. Gotta feel pretty bad. Jake picks him up and we're going to game three. Yeah, in, in that spot for Jake, if Eduardo's untapping, there's really not a way he gets back into this with all lands in hand. He still only has two draws, and Eduardo can just attack for one and basically guarantee that Jake is unable to kill him. And that's a lot of the risk of, or risk is the wrong word, but how polar some of the creatures can be, right? Where sometimes it's a one mana five point burn spell and it looks awesome. Sometimes it just gets completely outclassed by something bigger. and it's even worse than getting flooded because your cards can't even really attack or produce mana. Yeah, and that game, I think, does a pretty good job highlighting why it was really good for Jake to bring in those ensnaring bridges, where there's enough creatures from Eduardo's deck that, like, creature combat is not really what this is about. And so, like, stuff like Searing Blaze that enable you getting in with your creatures, probably not at its best, and it's best instead to try and avoid that game entirely and be in that same spot as last game would just infinite time to try and top deck burn spells if you have a bridge around okay and if you're a burn player this is the iconic this has got to be one of the most quintessential burn hands it looks so great and the reason it looks so great is because you only actually have one land and a prayer that another land is coming off the top yeah and we talked about that inevitability for for jake and i could see that mattering quite a bit here where if he's able to get in even a few points on the first two turns, which he should be able to, given he's on the play, that's nine points of burn in hand. That's probably six to eight points from the creatures. That's already 17. We've seen a number of fetches and shocks in Eduardo's deck, so that could be pretty awkward. This is also the kind of matchup where if you're in JXC, these games are close a lot of the time, right? Depending on how long you think the game's going to go against a deck that might just be trying to thought seize or grief you. It really incentivizes you to just keep anything that even comes close to functioning. And here, Jake's just saying, it's more likely I draw another land than it is I find a six that is better than this. Yeah, and I, I definitely like this keep from Jake. I agree with his, his reasoning here, particularly when so much of this matchup is just about counting. Right, and there's a point where having two different cards that can kill grief almost just makes it so that card has a sort of forced decision and just we'll have to stare back at Jake instead of actually being able to apply pressure. Yeah, this it's still a pretty awkward spot because Grief being a 4-3 specifically is brickwalling all of Jake's hand. There's, like, assuming the Lightning Helix gets taken here, none of Jake's creatures can attack, and suddenly that whole calculus of how, many, how much damage this hand re represents is thrown off completely. So... This is kind of the worst possible for how it could have gone for Jake, but Eduardo is down to is down to 
two cards in hand, and notably not dead after all returning tapped means there's still going to be some damage coming in for creatures from creatures unless Jake takes them. Whoa. Unless Eduardo takes them. Okay, so it does look like Eduardo actually went for the creatures instead of this Rift Bolt. What do you make of that? Uh, makes sense to me. It's one of two real angles that Eduardo could go down on. Uh, could go down. One is try and fight this blocking on the board game and just like chalk it up that the creatures are representing Ooh. a decent chunk of damage. Oh my but, god. Okay, not dead after all came that, off the top. I'm sorry to cut you off. This is so huge. Yeah. <laughs> because this Rift Bolt is going to happen in upkeep, which is before Jake could even draw another land to be able to cast the Lightning Bolt. Yeah, that's... that's or the Lightning Helix, rather. That's pretty brutal here. And, I mean, that's one more damage off the not dead after all thing. That's the Lightning Helix getting taken, so it's not life gain. And suddenly, I think, maybe Eduardo is winning this race? This is that was so huge. Oh my god. Could he, what does Jake just gonna turn this into a lava spike? Absolutely not. Rift bolt at grief. Eduardo says, target my grief. What a great idea. <laughs> not that after all saves it. A ping to Jake, a return of the grief to the battlefield, skull crack, helix, goblin guide to the options. I assume it's just helix. But maybe it's goblin guide. Yeah, I think I think it needs to be helix here. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it takes Goblin Guide. Helix still in the hand. Boros Charm joins it. This is just a bunch of twos. It looks like Eduardo's whole plan might just be you don't have lands. Yeah, lands lands are a myth anyway. And you know, if if there's never a land drawn and there's all these there's all these twos in hand, I'm I'm pretty sure Jake just has the one turn to try and find a land at this point. And if he doesn't if he doesn't, that's pretty close to lethal pressure. Particularly given the Sunbake Canyon is re representing damage, the damage off the roll token is re is pretty relevant here as well. Well, Fiery Island, this is a, it really feels like the monkey's paw sort of curled on this one. Okay, we're going to see Upkeep Lightning Helix from Jake, respecting the third copy of Not Dead after all. Luckily, yep. Eduardo does not have it fit. I want to draw attention to a pretty heads-up play from Jake there, which is not attacking with the Goblin Guide. That might seem strange, given the Goblin Guide's not blocking grief, it has menace, but it makes a lot of sense in that spot to assume your opponent has interaction, and it's quite likely to kill their Goblin Guide, and on top of that, any extra draw towards not a land there for Eduardo is so brutal. So it, it makes sense to try and minimize Eduardo's chances of finding something like a Scion. Ooh, speaking of Scion, Scion off the top for Eduardo might be about to join Orcish Bowmasters. Jake finds Ensnaring Bridge, still short on mana for that one. Jake Boros charming with Scion of Draco on the stack. Takes it back, isn't doing that. Scion hits the battlefield. Yeah, and, and at this point it's land for Ensnaring Bridge or bust. Any other way, I have to imagine uh, Jake just loses this game. Because there's enough life get being gained that it's pretty quickly over. I don't think there's really a reasonable line of racing with Burn. Yep, I agree with your diagnosis. Yeah, even even with a land for the ensnaring bridge, though, this is a pretty tough spot. That's oh, a low life total. How about an ensnaring bridge for the ensnaring bridge <laughs> to lock up Eduardo Sanscalic as third place finisher in Midgo Masters Season 1?